So hello and a warm welcome to the Refreshing Views Observatory. We've got two items to talk through today, two items I've been lent for a week. The first is the Bader Herschel wedge and we've then got a Daystar Quark. Now the beauty of these is that they plug into your existing telescope, you've got a telescope for observing the nighttime sky and you literally put these in as an accessory to safely observe the sun in the daytime. This is great for summertime use when it simply doesn't get dark at a reasonable enough hour at 51 degrees north. So when the days are really long, you can do some sometime observing as well. So my thanks to Nigel from my local astronomy club. Nigel has lent me these for the week. And at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you my views on which one I am going to purchase. So if you do do a lot of solar observing, then let me know your thoughts on which is best of the dedicated solar telescope, a Bader Herschel wedge or the Daystar Quark. So I've got the Megway 90 set up here on the EQ6. I've taken the Celestron C11 off uh, and I'll talk to you through why I've done that. Uh, and I've got the Megway 90 on this now, so we've got tracking. So make sure you stay to the end. You'll see some of the mistakes I've made and hopefully that will help you avoid the same mistakes I've done. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to give you my views on the pros and cons of each one because there's no perfect instruments. They're all trade-offs against each other. But I'll let you know my views on which one I am going to purchase. So before we start actually observing itself, let's just touch on safety. Now there's a few warnings about what I'm going to do and the most important thing is to be really bloody careful when you're observing the sun. Looking through the, looking at the sun with a telescope, with an unfiltered telescope, without the appropriate protection, it will be the last thing you see. They say you can look at the sun twice, once with one eye and then again with the second eye. So please be really careful. Never point the telescope near the sun without the filter in place. Keep the scope cover on, keep the dust cover on until that filter is in place. If you're swapping over adapters like I was, just put just put the dust cover on, just keep all that, that sunlight out. I also like just putting my hand over the top just to make sure it's not getting too hot before you put your delicate eyes over the top. And of course don't forget the smaller telescope, don't forget the secondary cover it up or better yet just remove it entirely and as always don't forget to subscribe and i look forward to bring you more videos as we explore the nighttime or today the daytime sky and before we dive into the video i want to give a big shout out to dave's astrophotography he's based in the beautiful island of cyprus we've actually chatted online a few times about his solar setup and the pros and cons of each uh, i'll put a link below have a look at what he's doing we've chatted a few times he's got a great setup well worth taking a look at his approach as well so just while we're talking about safety then, I've got the telescope pointing away from the sun. The sun's actually over there, so that's why I'm squinting as I look towards the sun. The uh, dust cover's on, so you're not getting any light coming through. We've got the finder scope has been removed, so we're not getting any inadvertent light through there. I'm putting my hand over the top, there's no, no light coming through, so it's not going to damage my eyes, it's not going to damage the camera. Okay, so let's have a look at the Quark, the Daystar Quark. So what the Quark does is by clever filtering inside an ethylon which I don't really understand it only passes through the wavelength of hydrogen alpha now this filters out all the light and makes it safe to observe and this means we get stunning views of the sun's chromosphere that's what radiates in the hydrogen alpha wavelength and this is where the action really is this is where they've got the flares the prominences the, the sort of mass ejections coming off from the solar surface and you still get to see the sunspots but you also get to see the activity around them. They're not cheap, but boy, this is fantastic. In the US, this is, I think, $1,300 when I looked on the website. And in the UK, it's £1,200, but that includes 20% VAT after sales tax. So I'm never too sure uh, what the how sales tax works in America. So $1,300 on the website, £1,200, including VAT in the UK. So there's two types of quark. We've got the prominent and the chromosphere. Now everyone says to get the chromosphere it provides better views and you still get to see the providences. So I don't know why Daystar offer both, I guess there must be a reason somewhere. But this is the chromosphere model and of course we can still see the prominences. Now what I'm liking here about the using the quark on the on the Megray 90 is that I now have a 90 millimeter hydrogen alpha telescope. And of course you can use this in the night time. So it's far more portable for my trip to Tenerife we're doing in the end of June. I can take that with me, take this with me as well, and I've got a 
the Hydrogen Alpha Telescope, in addition to the telescope I'm taking with me anyway. So a few words of advice then. So Daystar in their literature advise only to use a refractor for this. Now the reason is if you have a refracting telescope, either a Newtonian, a schmidt cassegrain like I've got the C11 or the Maksutov, you will cook the secondary mirror. All that, so all that solar heat, all that solar energy is coming down the telescope. It's bouncing off the primary mirror back up to the secondary and is literally going to cook it. So this only works if you already have a refractor, which is why my C11 has been swapped out for the Megray 90, which is a pity because I think the C11 with that big telescope would have been given a cracking view. The problem is you then would have had a cracked telescope. So cracking view, cracking telescope, it's best not to do it. The other thing to point out is that Daystar recommend fitting Daystar recommend fitting an infrared filter which is the one and a quarter inch filter we've got inside there and that acts as a reflector it reflects away a lot of the infrared heat stops it helps protect the quark inside reduces that energy going inside Nigel's got the one and a quarter inch filter screwed onto the nose piece I've read of other people as well who get the larger two inch and then screw it onto the front here or onto the diagonal itself so the other point to note as well is that you can tune the bandwidth the band pass of the etalon by adjusting this knob here the, that needs electrical power, so you need this 5 volt USB power supply. Now it comes with the mains uh, adapter. I've got a USB plug on my power supply, so I'm just simply using that. So you do need to have some form of 5 volt USB power or buy a battery adapter. The downside is that it takes a few minutes for those adjustments to take effect. But I found at about two thirds seems to be given a nice view of the sunspots and of the prominences so I just literally plug it in when I'm going to observe leave it to warm up while I'm rolling the roof back and get everything by the time I've got the dust covers off and pointing to the sun it's nearly there anyway so the other thing to note as well we need a tilt adapter if you're using the camera and the reason is you get this effect called Newton's rings and that's where, the, because the camera is so close to the optical surface, you get this weird interference pattern across the disc. So a tilt adapter just helps break that up. It just produces a little wedge angle between the camera and the quark. And the other thing to note as well, this has a built-in barlow. This is a times four built-in barlow. So the Megray itself is F6 plus the times four, so that's F24. So we're getting a very high resolution view of the surface of the sun. You are looking at individual uh, prominences and active regions you're not going to get that wide angle view that you can with a dedicated hydrogen alpha telescope like my Lunt 60 so just bear that in mind you're not going to be able to see the whole surface some people buy focal reducers and screw them in but then again you're still taking a number of frames and then mosaicing them together afterwards so the first thing you have to do with the quark is plug the USB in and then just check and if you can see in the sunshine just check that the LED has come on and the other thing I have is a soda finder which I've taken off the 60mm lunt and has a little hole at that end and a screen at that end and the light comes through the hole and shines on the screen at the back but what I haven't done is mounted it on the Megray so I'll just hold it on like that I find it absolutely staggering when we look at the sun. So you've got the little sunspots dotted around on the surface, and then you've got the, 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 the what do you call it, the, the flares on the limb, and they're absolutely staggering. And there's even one little bit that's just detached from the end. You know, and if you come back an hour later, it's all changed again. It really is wonderful. So I would say even with a 31 millimeter eyepiece, I'm only getting about, I don't know, two thirds of the solar disc in the field of view. And it is getting quite warm. Right, cable, 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 cable. Where did I put the cable? So I've just had a five minute 
faff around trying to find the cable that connects the camera to the computer and then found it exactly where I'd left it. Yeah. So the other thing I sometimes do as well, particularly the sun's at a suitable angle, is just roll the roof across a little bit, obviously making sure I'm nowhere near the telescope. And at least it does cut down on some of that, that strong sunlight just to give a little bit of shade. Let's have a look. Ooh, one big field of white. Oh, look at those Newton's rings. So we've got quite bad Newton's rings at the moment. Focus. Goodness me. That is beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Whew. Gosh, that is hot. Absolutely stunning. Oh, wow. Goodness me. Look at that. I tell you what, you don't half get hot and my hair goes all messy. But it gets so hot under there, I'm absolutely dripping. It's the exact opposite problems when you think back to my looking at the moon or looking at Jupiter or whatever and it was cold, you know, the damp was settling in. It was absolutely baking. Right, the next thing we must do is, is use one of these. Now this is a tilt adapter and what it does is it deliberately offsets, puts a wedge, puts an angle between the camera and the optical surfaces in the quark and that's why we're getting these these Newton rings, these interference patterns between the lens and between the quarks. So putting a little bit of tilt helps eliminate those. So I'll just fit that in now. Let's have a look then. Right. Uh, do, do, do. Let's adjust the focus. And cook myself again. Oh, that does look better. I would guesstimate that's got rid of all those rings. Oh, fantastic. Look at that. Okay, we've seen what we can do with the quark. Let's jump over to the Herschel wedge. So this is the Bada Herschel wedge. This is much cheaper than the quark, uh, and it provides high resolution views of the photosphere, the visible layer of the sun. And this is where we get to see detailed views of sunspots, the active regions. What you can't see is those high energy views of the chromosphere there, the flares and the prominences that we're looking at with the quark. So the sunlight comes down the telescope and it hits this prism. This has got a large prism inside, light bounces around and most of it comes out down through this side. So you get this diffuse warm glow coming out here. The energy then goes up or a tiny fraction of the energy comes up through there and then that goes into the eyepiece or through to the camera. So it comes in this lovely case. It's got lots of neutral density filters. You can adjust those and we'll come back to these later. So the advantage of the Herschel wedge, in, in my opinion, is the price of it so it's about a third the price of the quark the two inch version this one here costs about 400 pounds that's 600 dollars 400 pounds including fat so reading the literature and the two inch version like this this is safe up to six inches of aperture and you can get a smaller and cheaper version a one and a quarter inch version and that's safe up to four inches of aperture so 100 mil right so the other thing to note there's still a lot of light coming through the Herschel wedge so you do have to add the ND filter to avoid dazzling yourself. So you can see Nigel's put the ND filters in here. We've got a 3.0 and a 1.8. There's another important point as well. Refracting telescopes are typically optimized in the green wavelengths, which is the wavelength our eyes are most, uh, op most sensitive to, that 550 nanometer wavelength. Now the Herschel wedge is passing through all lights. It's white, looks white, it's red to blue. But we, if you use a solar continuum filter, that's a 10 nanometer narrowband filter. That's only letting through a very narrow part of the green. So that's the bit the telescope's optimized. That's so we need a nice clean, a nice clean but green image. So it's a bit weird to look at. You know, you used to look at the sun being yellow or orange, 
but with the with the green filter of course it's green with the camera that doesn't matter you can you can process that out afterwards so it does look kind of weird but it is a cleaner image so it is something that's worth doing as well so make sure you put the ND filters in make sure you've got the solar continuum filter as well it's another item you've got to purchase but well worth doing in my opinion that's the prism inside so that screws in like that and it's one of the weird things about this approach is that the is that right that goes in that way It goes on like so, but there's no um, what's the word sort of teeth or detente or something like that where you can screw these in. But that screws onto the same piece. So as you screw that in, you actually just end up rotating the first. So I'm finding this bit really hard to do, and I'm worried I'm just going to screw the screw the connector into the prism. So I think Barda should have done a done a better job on this adapter on this. Ad so I think Barda should have done a better job on this adapter. So let's screw that on like that. Just check I'm doing that right way around. Yes, yeah, so we've got the filter 3.0 first, then the 1.8, then the continuum, then they're doing their job properly. So there we have it. So we have a 3.0 ND filter, we have a 1.8 filter, and then the solar continuum filter. So I've just had a cracking view through the eyepiece. I've been zooming in and out, just getting the wide angle view and then zooming in as well. What I'm going to do, I'm going to swap the eyepiece out and then put the camera on and I'll show you what I can see through the eyepiece. I must admit it is another scorching day. One of the real benefits of having an observatory, in addition to having equipment already set up, is that of course it cuts out you know, a lot of the, the wind and it keeps you nice and warm when you're observing in the dark and the cold. And the downside is when the sun's Beating down, it gets really hot because there is no passing wind, there's no breeze through, so it does get a little bit warm now in the observatory. So that's the ASI 224 camera. This is my planetary camera, this is what I standard use, and I put a infrared cut filter just to give a nicer, cleaner image. Very green sun, and more importantly. Quite a spot on the solar disc in the field of view. Oh, for a motorised focuser. There we go, that's nice and sharp. And I have left my phone. Right, I'm going to have to take a break from filming. What I've done while I was setting up is my phone has suddenly hit the. I've left it in the sun. So, just to give you an idea of how warm it is in here, my phone is just shut down. I've obviously overheated it. So, there we go. There. Oh, wow, look at that. So you can see the sunspots there. Now I'm going to switch it back from black and white mode, if I can see the mouse. Yes, yeah, so that's how it appears to the eye with the green filter. I'll just reduce that down a bit. Yeah, that's a little bit better, isn't it? As you can see, you don't get this beautiful view of the prominences, all that solar activity. But what you do get is a really good view of the surface and being able to see the, the sunspots. But you can see that with the quark, so I'm kind of leaning just to going to get the quark. So what I'm doing now is just recording a thousand frames. I'm going to do bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left, and I'll mosaic those together into a solar disc. I'm not particularly interested in high resolution views with this. I'm deliberately gone for, I haven't put a Barlow in yet. So we are shooting at the native, I think it's F6, which is pretty undersaturated, undersampled. But for a nice wide angle view, that's all we need. So what I'm going to do now is put a Barlow in and see if we can get some higher magnification views of that. Now, so these are times two barlows, and what I'll do, I'll swap them one in one, see what happens. focus 
So you've seen the Quark in action, you've seen the Herschel Wedge in action. So I have a choice now, do I keep my dedicated 60 millimeter Lunt telescope? Great views of the solar activity, you get a wide angle field of view, thus with a bar that you can zoom in and see the high resolution details. But at the end of the day, you are constrained, it is a 60 millimeter telescope. And it's an extra telescope to take when we have our trip to Tenerife or when we're on our family holidays. The second option, of course, is the Quark. That's a relatively affordable way to get into solar imaging if you already own a refractor. But it only gives you high resolution views, but that's where all the action is. The details and the prominence is around the active regions. You also need an IR filter and you'll also need a tilt adapter for the camera. So again, it's another, another purchase cost to consider. But it does give you an affordable 90 millimeter solar telescope and it's so portable it's the size of an eyepiece it's the size of a you know coke can or something like that so it is a very practical way of observing the solar activity and the other third option of course is the much more affordable herschel wedge but with that you only get to see the sunspots you know the surface of the sun so you are constrained you can't see those fascinating prominences that come and go with time so much more affordable, but you don't get that sort of hydrogen alpha view. So like everything in life, there's no perfect answer. And I must admit, I am leaning towards the Quark, simply because I then have a very portable 90 millimeter solar telescope. My thanks once again to Nigel Davison for loaning me the Quark and for the Herschel Wedge, and to Dave's astrophotography for his advice and comments as well. So don't forget to subscribe as we start exploring this time the daytime sky. So hello and a warm oh, no, I like that. So what are the other things? Yeah, what was I was gonna say. Doesn't matter.